So today we're working on a 1993 or 1994 Bockstrad uh, 37 with a 25 lead pipe, just the standard configuration. You can see how the bell is bent downward and inward here. It's been road hard and put away wet. And then we also have a bent lead pipe that you're about to see. There you can see how it curves inward and the finger hook has been bent. And then the bell tail has been pushed in as well. Uh, and even though the bell tail was pushed in, which transfers to the first slide, we can tell by just the way the marks line up that the first slide uh, was not assembled correctly at the factory because it's not at 90 degrees. So now we're starting to take the instrument apart and kind of just checking out the condition of the slide tubing, seeing how dirty it is. Uh, there are really a lot of dirtier instruments out there than this one. So it's it's really not in too bad a shape cleaning wise. Checking the dump slide here so it doesn't come out freely, which means we're probably going to have to work on it just a little bit. One, two free valve caps. That first valve cap is stuck. Uh, the second slide on the instrument is also stuck. Let's see the condition of the pistons. Really in pretty good shape except for the valve stems. The valve stems are very rotted and the felts are very compressed. We're going to end up replacing these valve stems. Uh, there's no way that we're doing the level of work that we're doing on this instrument and letting it leave with rotted valve stems. So let me just put the vice grips on this piston and that should get it out. First is the first valve is always the furthest away from where the valve where the air enters the valve block. And so usually the third valve stem is the worst and then followed by the second and the first. The further away you get from the air stream, the cleaner the instrument is. So we are going to have to get some tools here. I call this the slide knocker outer. It's just a tapered rod. Uh, it at least fits half of the contour of the slide. We don't want to use it too much, but it's good for at least getting the slide started and then usually you can pull them out. We're also going to knock the bottom caps with the rawhide mallet. It's a one and a quarter inch rawhide mallet. Uh, if you guys have a chime mallet, you can use that. That's enough to get the valve caps free. We'll move the body out of the way and get this dump slide out. So this was also very easy to do. Usually when the dump slides are seized up, they are very, very difficult to remove. And you can look at the trumpet sitting there right now. You can see what happened to it. It probably got sat on at some point. You can just see how it just goes, huh? Uh, but we're getting ready to remove the, the stop rod that uses a two millimeter or five sixty fourths Allen wrench. So we do have stuck valve stems. All of the corrosion on these valve stems made them stuck. Uh, if I can get the camera to focus here, give it just a minute. So step one would be try to remove it with the pliers wrenches. That doesn't work. They just spin freely. I'm not worried about it spinning freely since we're replacing these. But the next option that we have is fire. So let's get the torch adjusted here to its hot its flame. And then we have some quenching juice, a.k.a. water. <laughs> And we're just going to heat this until it starts smoking. And eventually, the valve oil that has leaked into it catches on fire. So we have piston flambe. And then we're going to quench it. And that expansion and contraction is what breaks the, the bond of the corrosion. 
And so I'm going to heat it up a second time. A little bit of that water might have gotten into the threads. And whenever the water boils, it might help break some of the corrosion as well. But this is, this is probably unnecessary. But I just like doing it. Then we're going to chuck these up in the bench motor. My JL Smith screwdrivers actually fit the spring barrel perfectly. It's taken me a little bit of time to find the backside of it. And then let me shuffle the camera around here so I can actually hold on to everything. I need a third arm. But that corrosion should break pretty easily, and there it did. I just need a little bit of leverage. So now we're moving on to the dent removal. The first thing we've got to do is at least get this bell primarily or initially straightened out so we can at least fit it on the dent mandrels. Uh, we want to straighten it out before we disassemble the instrument because the braces actually kind of tell us where the metal should go. And so we want to get everything as straightened out as we can assembled and then we will remove the bell on the instrument. I'm using a trombone mandrel right now because the diameter is simply larger. I'm just kind of force everything down. If the bell buckles, it buckles. It's already damaged. And then the trumpet is bent further down as well. So we're going to straighten out further down in the bell with the trumpet mandrel. My saying is things always have to get uglier before they get prettier. I'm going to put the first slide in. So we can move both of the tubes at the same time and start getting the bell tail straightened out as well. I'm putting a valve casing mandrel in 665 thousandths. Uh, that's a little, Bach kind of falls in the 664, 5, 10 thousandths range. Uh, but I'm putting that in there so the valve casing doesn't go out of round and trying to straighten the bell tail here. Get the slide tubes at least as much into alignment as I can before doing intensive work. The alignment is the really picky thing that I pay attention to. Um, and then let's go ahead and get the bell taken off of the instrument. So I've already done a little bit of the disassembly here. Uh, I'm using that business card because it keeps the solder from adhering to the bell of the instrument. Wipe off some of the excess solder, and then let's get the mouth pipe off of the instrument. So prior to all of this being done, the instrument was ultrasonically cleaned and scrubbed with brass brushes. And so everything is clean and ready to have work done. I kind of have this constant scowl on my face right now because I have a cold sore on my upper lip. So I apologize that I just look angry <laughs> throughout this entire process. I promise I'm not. I'm really enjoying myself. There we can see some of the dents in the bell crook. What I'm using is a modified Roth tool. I'll give credit to Chase Cavalier who has been making this Roth tool mod. Uh, it's just a set screw at the top of the tool that holds on to the wire. 
and keeps the wire from pulling back through the the Roth tool whenever you go to remove the dent ball. And it helps a lot, actually. So props to Chase Cavalier for that mod. So I'm just kind of inspecting the dent here. I've selected a dent ball. I've, I've probably been through a few dent balls at this point. I'm just trying to show you guys the highlights. Okay, so what I'm doing here is hollow tapping. Uh, so we have a ridge on the edge of the bell. And I'm trying to get that ridge to release its tension. Because what I'm doing as I'm removing these dents is I am also re-rounding the bell crook. Part of the factory correction service is getting the bell crook tubing to actually be round. Uh, when Bach bends their bells on trumpet, they actually, the, the bending media that they use allows the tubing to compress a little bit and it gets out of round during the bending process. And so one of the modifications that you can make to a Bach trumpet is to take the bell off of it and get the tubing to be truly round and then fill it with a bending media that you'll see here in a little bit and re-bend the bell where the tubing is round and the geometry of the bell is also correct. But let's get to the dent work here. I'm just roughing out the dents on the mandrel at this point. Just using the big rawhide mallet. Credit to my co-worker Kiki, Kiki Collier for recording this footage. I have a hard time saying my cuz. So Kiki, I am sorry your name is hard for me to say. And then we're just going to start rolling the dents out. Uh, every now and then I will stop and push a dent up from the inside before I roll over it. I don't know if you'll get to see me do the pushing up. Nope, so we're going to fast forward to taking care of the actual majority of the damage. So let's just get rolled over this. We're going over the braced area right now. But you can see how dented this bell is in that area. I'm just hoping at this point that it will all come out. Got to shake my hands out a little bit. I have some problem with some uh, neuropathy in my hands. Some numbness. So I'm going to straighten the bell a little bit more. Just kind of feeling the dent. We'll go ahead and start rolling this with the biggest roller that we have. Just try to get this basically to conform to our will. The rolling process does take a lot of physical effort. Um, you're not able to see my face during this, but I'm really straining. I'm a pretty heavy guy. I'm about 340 pounds right now. And I'm probably putting half of my body weight down, but... We, we got the rolling done on that section, and now I'm going to level the bell rim. Sorry you guys aren't able to see the entirety of the process, but it would have been a three-hour video, and no one wants to watch a three-hour video. So I'm getting the, the bell rim leveled on our granite leveling block right now. I'm 
not too much to narrate about this. You just got to slide the bell back and forth and see where the high and low spots are and tap on the high spots and let the block bring up the low spots. When I say not much to say, I mean really not much to say. It's just a, it's a picky process. So now, before I actually work on the flare, I am going to buff it. Because the, the bell flare, usually a trumpet often gets set on a trumpet stand, and so the water key drips onto the bell rim. And that leads to excess corrosion on about a quarter of the bell flare. And so what I want to do is just go ahead and get all of that corrosion off of there. Get down to a clean surface. And then we're going to use the dent machine to take care of just the rim. This is actually my first time using the dent machine for a job like this on a professional instrument. Uh, that's a little touchier. And so I've already got the, it's the smallest power disc and the tapered roller set up. And I'm just barely going to apply pressure and then work the bell back and forth. And usually on a trumpet bell that gets damaged in the way that this one was, you have a ring around where the soldered rim is. And that ring on the inside of the flare develops because the metal gets stretched. And what we're trying to avoid here is that stretched metal. Uh, and then I'm going to do the rest of the flare by hand. First thing we're going to do is we stretch the metal the opposite direction with the dent machine. And so we're going to get that just leveled out. And it's going to lead to not even having a, a ring around the inside of the flare. That would indicate that any damage was actually done. Using the same tapered roller from the dent machine is also my primary trumpet roller. Trying to keep the pressure as even as possible under my hands. This is preliminary rolling. using the Furry's bell iron. And the long chuckable roller I use as a double-handed dent roller. And so I'm just getting all of the high spots. I would consider the spots that are sticking out of the bell the high spots. And then the mandrel itself from the inside takes care of the low spots. So we're just going over the entire surface of the outside of the bell and burnishing it, essentially. Except using the roller leads to less marking on the instrument. As long as you're using a highly polished dent tool, I should note. Uh, even if you use a roller, if it is rusty or anything like that, it's still going to leave marks in the surface of the instrument. So just polish your dent tools every now and then. Move back on to the final blend rolling. I never realized how small I make a trumpet look. I am a large man. So not too much to say about this, just trying to keep the pressure as even as possible. We want to get the full circumference of the bell. And there you can kind of see the results. So the next thing we're going to do is go buff the bell. So we want to get the entire surface of the bell buffed up. Uh, during the 
unsoldering process that involves wiping excess solder off of the instrument and so sometimes that leaves a little bit of hazing on the instrument and we want to get those shadows of solder removed as well and then we just want to while the instrument is apart and we have more access to these areas we want to go ahead and get them buffed so I'm using a small buffing wheel for the inside of the bell flare right now. And then we're going to switch to a larger buffing wheel to get the outside of it. I'll use the small buffing wheel for right against the rim because it has more of a fine knife edge to it. So just applying more buffing compound. Getting the discolored areas from the excess solder off. So we do want to be careful when we're doing this buffing that we don't go through the silver plating. If we use light enough pressure, then we don't have to worry about going through the silver because it's more of a burnishing action rather than a cutting action. And what I should say is a burnishing action in regards to the softness of the silver, but a cutting action to remove the excess solder because lead and even the, the silver tin solder is softer than straight silver. And so it takes a really fine touch to be able to know uh, what sort of pressure you can use to remove that excess solder. It's not the tools, it's the technique. And that is something that I'm always working on to improve is my technique of using the tools that I am given. And so I use the smaller wheel because it has a lower and surface. So I use speed the smaller per wheel minute, because it has less just has a less aggressive cut than the larger whenever wheel. Whenever the buffer this is larger rotating. wheel is good for just getting and the so the that buffing the bolt leads to a, a less aggressive quickly. cut. I was using the smaller wheel the, also the solder one plating. because of the knife edge. So this is what we're going to use to fill the bell wheel. More this is a cero bend. You can see there it melts at 100. So here's the cero bend Fahrenheit. I'm going to and this is the very crude double boiler that I keep in. Uh, this heats up the water boils and it melts the cero bend once it reaches 158 degrees. While that's melting, we're going to fill up a bucket with cold water. We live in the transition zone, and so it's been between 40 and 50 degrees during the day. That's cold enough water. We don't need any ice. We're just going to fill up that bucket. And so while that bucket is filling up and while the water is boiling, we are going to make sure that the bell crook is actually round. So I had done some preliminary measurements and realized that it was really close to round, which is pretty impressive. Usually I get them way out of round, but this one was in good shape. And so we just have the, it's a dual radius bend where it has tight bends at the top and bottom of the crook and then the middle of the crook is pretty broad and the middle of the crook was actually very close to round and the tighter bends were more out of round but just by a few thousands and part of that is because of the repair process that i used as i was removing the dents from the crook i was also re-rounding the crook knowing that i was getting it closer to round and so I used a few extra dent balls during the process that I might not have used had I just been removing the dents. But knowing that I was rerounding it, 
I knew that I was saving myself time down the road. And so we're just measuring and manipulating by hand until everything measures within a couple of thousandths of an inch. I don't think it's reasonable to ask for a crook to be perfectly round, a tapered crook to be perfectly round within more than a couple thousandths of an inch. But we've got that round. You can see how the it has opened up, which is why we have to bend it. The crook spreads into a V whenever it should be parallel, like two eyes next to each other. And so we have to fill it and then re-bend the crook. And this is where my modification happens. So here we're just stirring the last little bits of the unmelted cero bend into it. Then we're going to go ahead and fill the bell. I just pour until the liquid is even with the exit, or in this case, actually the entrance. So the purpose of the Cero bend is if you try to bend a hollow tube, then the tube is going to collapse and it's going to kink over. But what this does is basically makes a flexible mandrel inside the tubing that allows that prevents the tubing from collapsing any further. So here we are sticking it in the water to cool it off. Um, but that that flexible mandrel is what is needed to keep the tubing from collapsing or kinking over when we go to rebend everything. Some people will use, will either take the bell off and then solder a rod across the bell, or they will just leave the instrument assembled and then send dent balls through it. But I, my reason for doing it my way is because I feel like it's best to let the metal do what the metal wants to do. And if the metal wants to unbend rather than stretch to fit the contour that already exists, why not just let the metal bend to where it wants to be because you end up with a more even wall thickness uh, rather than ending up with stretched metal on the outside of the bend while the metal on the in, while the thickness on the inside of the bend is preserved. So that is why I use my method because I feel like it ends up with a more even wall thickness in the end and we can always adjust braces and everything as needed. Uh, and so let's get on to what I'm doing here. I'm just disassembling the first slide. I did forget to take pictures and video of actually re-soldering the first slide, but basically this just needed to be taken apart and put back together. Uh, and the excess solder cleaned out of the solder joints. It was, it was not a difficult repair. Literally, take the two tubes off, which you've already seen, and then clean the solder out and put them back together. Here you can see the action that we've got out of the slide after doing this repair. And we also squared everything up where everything is at 90 degrees. You're not going to find better first slide action anywhere. So we're also going to go ahead and align the third slide. So it is a little bit off. I use a hybrid mixture of caliper alignment and just kind of feeling things out. I do believe in strategic misalignments where a tube does not is not always assembled from the factory in a certain in perfect alignment. Uh, I find that that is pretty much the case regardless. You're not going to get the alignment within a thousandth of an inch on a trumpet slide. And so over time, the slide, although the action may be good, it does wear more on one edge than it does the other. 
And then eventually you end up with tubes that are tapered over time. And so whenever we go to correct the alignment, the alignment on a tube at this point, then we have to strategically misalign the slide to put the center of either the outer or the inner slide in that taper. And if I could draw you a picture, then it would make more sense. But basically like sticking a pencil in a pencil sharpener, the pencil sharpener is tapered and the pencil is not. And the tip of the pencil always gets to the center, whether you push down on the pencil or pull up on the pencil and try to make it crooked, it's always going to end up in the center. And so that's where the strategic misalignments come into play. And that is what I had to apply on this third slide. So now we're going back to the reassembly process. I'm getting the mouth pipe put in place. I've already bent the brace just a little bit. Uh, the, the upper and lower legs of the tuning slide did not quite line up. And we have corrected that with just bending the tuning slide brace slightly. I also needed to adjust the height of the valve casing braces, and so those have been removed, and we'll be soldering those back on in place. Just making sure that everything fits with practically no tension. And making sure that the brace flange sits level. So we're going to get the lower half of the casing brace soldered on first. And then we'll adjust the upper half of the flange, the, the longer, skinnier part of the flange to fit the mouth pipe rather than making the brace fit the valve casing. careful application of heat. Lots of heat control here. I'm heating the inside and letting the heat soak outward. And we'll apply a little more flux just to make the surface look a little bit cleaner. That's how you get the nice shine on your solder joints is to apply flux and heat it one more time before you finish things off. And here we are soldering the mouth pipe to the brace. The main tuning slide has been made sure that it is straight and parallel, level and parallel. Once the solder solidifies, I'm going to go ahead and finish the cooling off process with water. Just spray it down. And then we'll do a little bit of solder wiping while we have access. I use ultra fluffy pipe cleaners for actually getting into tight spaces because I don't want to stick my fingers in there near the fire. I already burned myself enough. Just doing picky cleanup work here. The less solder that is left on the instrument, the less buffing we will have to do, and that means the less silver will be removed. So going back to why you would want the factory correction service, uh, if you think of a sound wave as bouncing off of two tubes, then it makes a lot more sense whenever you think about a curve. So going back to being not round uh, along the axial surface, then you have the sound wave has to travel further in either the left or right direction or the up and down direction. And it basically just makes the instrument acoustically inefficient because the sound wave for each wavelength is having to travel further 
in one direction than it is the other. And so as round as you can get the tubing as possible, then that furthers itself to making the instrument acoustically perfect. And so what I'm doing here, and the reason that I use CeroBend is because the tubing does not collapse with CeroBend like it does with the factory bending media. And so right here, I'm now refitting the bell to the instrument by bending that crook and changing the radius of the crook while keeping the tubing round because the CeroBend does not collapse. What we are going for is the bell to be parallel to the lead pipe and parallel to the first slide tube. So we have the Cero bend emptied from the bell at this point. I didn't video that portion of it, but it's kind of cool. It, it, it's just, you heat the bell up and the Cero bend just pours out of it. It heats up slowly and pours out. But now we're gonna get the bell resoldered onto the instrument, starting with the first slide to bell brace. This is the most important one because that sets the relationship of the entire bell to the instrument. The smallest misalignment here translates to big misalignments in the rest of the bell. And so now that we've got that set, we're gonna solder the valve casing brace into its new position, heating the inside once again. It almost looks like a freeze frame because I'm moving so little. Huh, I never realized that before. So you're getting some, uh, a hot, you're getting a hot take. Look at that. Just kiss it. Just kiss it with the heat. Fine soldering takes a very fine hand control, very fine heat control. So now we're going to fit the braces to the instrument. Basically, we have to bend the Z to different angles. Um, you want the brace to fit in the instrument where you essentially do not need braces except to keep the brace from falling out. You don't want to use a, uh, a clip or a clamp to force the instrument together, to force the brace to stay in there. You only want a spring-loaded clip to keep the brace from falling out of the instrument simply because of the design being a Z-clip. It's not balanced. But this is where the zero tension assembly comes into play. The tighter you can get that brace fit, the less tension there's going to be in the assembly. So I'm fine tuning this forward brace at this point. We've got both the braces fit and now there's the one clamp that I'm talking about. So the brace will stay where it's supposed to be. The clamp is just to keep it from falling out. And then we're gonna get these fore and aft braces fit and soldered to the instrument. Start applying heat. I usually start with the forward brace because that's the, the most important one for the way the instrument plays. I've already done a little bit of playing around with the location of the forward brace on this instrument and the stock location is pretty much good. But we've got that solder taken care of, and so we'll go ahead and cool it off. And then we will solder the other side. And I switch back and forth between holding the instrument in playing position 
and holding the instrument where gravity creates a cup that the solder can flow into. And as long as you have the final step of holding the instrument in playing position and then heating the brace to where the solder is, uh, is molten and it allows it to release the tension in playing position, then you're going to get as little tension as possible in your bell brace assembly. The only way that you would get less tension in a bell assembly is by using a three-piece brace, and it could be arguable as to whether or not you would get more or less tension in a three-piece brace because you do have heat shrinkage to keep in mind. Then we're going to go over to the buffing machine and get all of the solder joints buffed. Because the, the soldering process discolors the silver plating. And so we have to remove the surface layer of it, unfortunately, to get it back to a shiny surface. So I'm using the small wheel once again because the lower surface feet per minute allows a bigger window for error. It's not going to remove the material as fast as quickly, and so, therefore, you have more time to react to what the wheel is doing to the metal. Just trying to get in as many angles as I can on it. Some of these spots will have to be hand polished, but we're hand polishing the entire instrument anyway. So next, we are going to move on to removing the dents in the second and third slide crooks. You can see the dents in the second crook right there. Minor but major at the same time. We want to go ahead and get those out. And then there's the third slide crook. This customer did not have third slide stop nuts and that is why the third slide continually fell out. We are replacing those stop nuts with a new set of nuts. But all that we do is just pass the the dent back and forth over this tiny ball and that pushes the dent out and then we'll use some hollow tapping which I do off camera to lower the high points and this just it evens everything out kind of blends everything in together the third slide on this one proves to be much more difficult than the second slide because there is a dent in the side of the third slide that it turns out I was not able to get out. Uh, I don't think it's going to really affect the playability of the instrument based on the location. It's on the inside of a crook, and so the metal is already really thick there. So it's probably not affecting anything. But now we are getting the dents out of the very end of the third slide crook, the angle that our rods fit on. We just we have to use a second type of dent rod. There's the second and the third. Now let's move on to polishing. I am using Flitz metal polish. I'll be switching to the liquid flitz as soon as this tube is gone. I just can't justify buying liquid flitz as long as we have paste flitz still available to us. 
but I'm just going to paint the entire instrument with this flitz polish. And then we're going to hand rag it with flannel that we get from Hobby Lobby. We just get plain old flannel and cut it into strips. And you can already see the difference that's making. Get up against the braces. Just, just sit back and enjoy the polishing process. This is the most zen moment in the entire repair process. This is where everything is starting to finally come together. And you just kind of get to relax and say, okay, now we get to make the instrument look good. We've got it performing well. Now we get to make it look good. So just enjoy the process. Is it too quiet for you? Hmm. Just enjoy the silence. This is what it's like for me when I polish a trumpet. Flip to the other side. Everything just slows down. I'm able to just focus on one tube after the other. It's really zen. If you guys have any questions for me about this process, feel free to comment them below. I'll answer as many of them as I can. Got to get every square inch. It's a trumpet. There's no excuse for missing tubing. This is where our process differs from your home silver polish or the silver polishing cloth in your case is you're not able to get down into the nooks and crannies of the instrument. And with our methods and our supplies, we are able to get into the nooks and crannies. So now we're going to move on to polishing the slides. These go quite a bit faster. Just a, a quick kiss of the slide tubes. You don't really want to polish your slide tubes uh, because it removes material from them and makes it harder for the slide grease to stick to the slide. But there's not much of a way to avoid at least kissing them in this process. Buy some more flits. Just 
just get this main tuning slide polished. Now we're going to move over and just buff the valve caps. I always buff my valve caps. If you use a light touch, just like I said earlier, then the jeweler's rouge specifically is more of a burnishing the silver step rather than removing the silver step. Then let's get on to assembly. So the first thing we're going to do is get the valve guides inside the, the spring barrels and get the springs inside the spring barrels. Get the new valve stems in place. And then we are going to start aligning the valves. Uh, I don't do a necessarily precision valve alignment, but I do a probably within five thousandths valve alignment on my on most of my instruments. Uh, I can do precision valve alignments. I can do the math on it, but I'm a believer that within five thousandths of an inch, no one's going to be able to make a difference. No one's going to be able to tell a difference. And so here we are measuring the upstroke of the pistons, deciding what felt to use, using an 80 thousandths felt, or not felt, but synthetic pad, all three pistons required the same, 80 thousandths synthetic pad, so that was pretty good. But we've also got to check the downstroke. And that is where the factory rubbers, which is not typical of Bach, failed. Uh, and we ended up having to do a, I think it was a 90 thousandths on the third valve for the downstroke. A 100 thousandth on the first valve for a downstroke. And then 110 thousandths on the second valve for a downstroke. So here I am just experimenting with different felts, kind of figuring out what visually works. And if I, if I end up having to prioritize anything in the bore, I'm going to prioritize the open valve combinations compared to the closed valve combinations. Because closed valve tubing already has bends to it and is not as efficient as the open wrap. And so why not just make the misalignment in each valve combination and just chalk it up to the, the feel of the valve section. So now we'll get some oil put on everything. Or excuse me, I was just checking the valve alignment on that one. Now we're going to go ahead and get the, the bottom caps put on and get the valves oiled. So we use a Roche Thomas valve oil as our generic valve oil in the shop. And then we use lanolin 
for non-action slides. So basically every slide on a low brass instrument or the main tuning slide and second valve slide on a trumpet. And then what we use for the action slides, which is the first and third slide on a trumpet, we use sewing machine oil, which also doubles as a uh, an oil thickener for our bearing valve jobs. Whenever we do a cleaning, we use that uh, sewing machine oil to thicken up the valve oil on the spindles. So here I am applying the sewing machine oil to the first and third slide tubes. And just getting everything put together. We get the second slide and the main tuning slide in place. Got to get the stop nuts and stop rod put on too. And these stop nuts and stop rods never go on in the same way that they came off. So you always seem to have to do a little bending to get them to not drag inside the post. We'll change the water key pad. Got to dig this one out. It's been in there for a while. Goodness. We'll be replacing this with the JL Smith cork, synthetic cork. So now I'm just trying to get a piece of lint out of the water key spring. Uh, this is one of the downsides of polishing the instrument with the water key on. Then we'll apply the heavy grease. To the main tuning slide get it put in we're about ready for the play test and i cannot wait at this point very excited to see what this trumpet can do get the second slide put in same heavy grease and then let's see how this thing turned out There it is. Turned out so good. So there we have the area where the bell was completely dented before. Bent in multiple directions. We have all the solder joints where we took the bell off. Everything in the bell crook and tail is now straight. And the instrument is really just put together the way it should have been put together. A nice Bach 37. And so here in just a second, you can see there, just, just look at that, Bach 37. Let's see how this thing sounds. <laughs> 